Hello and welcome to The Big Picture. The much needed and awaited national cyber security policy was released today by the IT and Communications Minister Kapil Sibyl. The policy aims at securing the air defense systems, power infrastructure, nuclear plants, telecommunication systems among others. The real challenge however is in operationalizing the system. What with a woeful lack of cyber professionals at present in India apart from other issues. Meanwhile, this policy coming as it does in the shadow of revelations of the unprecedented spying program of the United States and our own intelligence and other agencies involved in similar snooping operations. Many issues have come to the fore. How far this policy will be able to address these issues, empower citizens, make them feel safe and at the same time protect their privacy, all needs discussion. Today we will look at all this with Wing Commander Ajay Lele, research fellow at the Institute for Defense Studies and Analysis, who was also a member of the Task Force on Cyber Security. Prabir Purka is the chairperson of the Knowledge Commons as well as vice president of Free Software Movement of India, Ravi Visveshwarya Sharda Prasad, an independent telecom consultant, and Shalini Singh, deputy editor, The Hindu. Welcome to all of you. Uh, Ajay Lele, I would like to come to you first. This policy, uh, is this policy aimed more towards protecting the government systems or is it, is it something which will, you know, it is all encompassing? Uh, to my mind, cyber can't be fragmentized like a government system or a private system. Right. Because cyber is everywhere. So from that perspective, you just can't have a policy which could only address the issues related with one agency. Right. And from that point of view, this policy should be all pervasive and it should involve both state as well as the non-state actors who are involved into various cyber issues. Okay, uh, what about uh, issues of you know safety, privacy? All these issues will, would have been addressed by in, in this policy, right? Uh, definitely, all these issues have been addressed in this policy. Uh, the policy has got various uh, subparts to it, and it is addressing these issues into a different sort of a formats. But essentially, what this policy talks about is that it is talking of uh, devising a mechanism which should be a central mechanism. Right. Presently what's happening is that you got a Ministry of Defense, you got Ministry of Home Affairs, right. you got various other agencies. Everybody has got their own problems related with cyber and everybody is looking at solutions from their own perspective. What was required is to have to have a holistic policy and from that perspective I think this policy... A national be... nodal uh, agency is being set up. Is, exactly. That, that is what is being talked about. That so, what the will be the role of this nodal agency? This nodal agency will try to incorporate the issues which are being addressed today independently by far too many agencies in India. That is the first thing which it will try to do. Then it will try to bring in a synergy into the system. Again, what's happening is that today we got a lot amount of problems, but we don't have a trained manpower. So, right. there are projections that you are going to look at uh, devising a mechanism that within next five years or so, we will have five lakh people who are trained right. uh, on all these issues. Then the most important aspect is that there will be not only a government participation over here, there will be a huge amount of a participation by the private industry also over here. So from that point of view, I think uh, this is going to take all the sections of the society, whether it is a government or a private, because the issues related to cyber are not going to affect only government infrastructure. Absolutely. Uh, Prabir, coming to you, he, uh, Ajay Lele raised an important issue and it's, it's, it seems to be part of the uh, policy also to involve the private, uh, a, a lot of private sector people into this. One of the things that, you know, private security firms are also being involved and uh, from what the minister says, he says that, you know, the private firms will be only involved in training, manpower and, um, you know, and research. Do you think this is uh, something which uh, can cause some concerns? Well, you know, First, I think it's very important to understand that there are major American companies who we now know have been a partner to the American snooping efforts. Right. AT&T has been identified as an active partner in this. Verizon, of course, is not in India, has also been identified as another. And so have been Google, Facebook and others. So we have a situation, they're all also thought to be as Indian companies. Right. In fact, they are a part of FICCI. And they have been on Indian delegations when the delegation has gone to Dubai, for instance, in the international conference, which took place last year. So you have a whole set of people involved in the belief that this is 
private without understanding that private has Indian and also international players. Right. And international players are under, some of them are under their domestic laws. In this case, all American companies are under their domestic laws and they have to give certain access to the American secret uh, service agencies, including, of course, the National Security Agency. So we need to be very careful of what, how do you define private in this case. Private has to be quote unquote Indian, if you will. Second part of it, I think it's very important also to define what the Indian agencies are protecting. And unfortunately, the problem is we at the moment are starting with a very low level of uh, what I would call security consciousness, even in the government. I'm, I'm, I'm happy that the policy is there, but you not, have not to, talk, not to talk about ordinary citizens. Ordinary citizens will follow where the government leads, <laughs> and we have been following the government very effectively. So you have s sensitive intelligence agencies giving their email addresses as Gmail in the belief that that is better protected, more encrypted, more secure than the NIC is. Now, if it is true that NIC is so bad, that's a very serious cause for concern. And if they don't know, the intelligence agencies don't know, which is public knowledge, at least amongst a certain section, that Gmail has to provide, Google has to provide access under national security letters. They fought a case in the US Supreme Court on this. And they, that is also, any Gmail is therefore accessible to the US government. They really are in a bubble, which is very dangerous for all of us. I mean, we have we have been discussing. In fact, last in the last two weeks, we have had three, four discussions on this. The, just just the concerns expressed by some of the people who have been participating in the discussion is scary. Absolutely. Anyway, uh, Ravi, coming to you. One of the things which the, you know we, we have discussed last week also when we were discussing about this uh, snooping operations by the U.S. Uh, agencies. You know. It, as far as India is concerned, we know that you know there are several intelligence agencies operating, having different, uh, and, and you know all of them have access to various things. You think this national nodal agency will be able to, you know, uh, will all these intelligence agencies also come under the nodal agency? Well, uh, more than that, I want to say that actually it's a welcome move because what you had is you had different organizations implementing their own cybersecurity policies independently, and it was a mishmash. Uh, for instance, you have a lot of our computer systems actually go back to the 60s. Uh, and what uh, one thing I want to say is the most, the biggest danger facing India are the SCADA controlled dams. You know, you have all these dams of Bhakra, Nangal and all. They're all controlled by what is called SCADA, Supervisory Control and Data Acquisition Systems. Those are vulnerable to worms Attacks. like the Stuxnet. So suppose a terrorist attacks the Bhakra, Nangal dam and says release so many million tons of water half of India will be wiped out. And that is the biggest danger. danger. So this cyber security policy at least is coming together to address some of the concerns of the infrastructure sector. Right. For instance, your telecommunications is highly vulnerable to uh, worms, uh, viruses, worms, and sabotage, uh, cyber sabotage, your power systems, sewage systems, and the most important are your dams, because all your, half your dams the software in them is very primitive, dating back to the 1960s, not been maintained. Uh, some of your nuclear power plants are, are vulnerable, again, to cyber attacks. So you have to be very careful. Uh, you, this policy, at least if you have a central nodal agency, which will coordinate with the institution whose, uh, 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 cyber system, whose information systems and telecommunication systems are at risk, then it certainly provides a better level of, ex of ex information exchange as well as upgrading of technology. Because a lot of these uh, companies have really, uh, uh, these not institutions upgraded. have not updated their cyber systems for a long time. And they're very vulnerable to uh, attack by uh, uh, you know, a savvy cyber terrorist. But Ravi, I must say this, yes. that the 60s systems are actually much better protected because they're so primitive. Yeah, in, in fact, fact the threat, except the SCADA system. Even the SCADA, SCADA system. No, the SCADA because system, I work yeah. on the SCADA system. Yeah, but the SCADA, you know, for instance, the Stuxnet was, a sim, was attacking the Siemens controllers. Yeah. And the Siemens controllers that they were attacking were relatively much uh, newer. Okay, so, uh, and number yeah. one. And number two, they have all internet 
connectivity. So they have that ability. That Fortunately, is. those PLCs we are talking about, yeah, the SCADA system, no, but, but, them are not they are not, but, I, but, but yes, I'm sure there is a risk to the SCADA systems otherwise. Okay. Agreed. Probably, but I'm sure that you know now with this policy coming in, there'll be there'll be a lot of effort to upgrade the systems, and those primitive systems will no more be operational. I'm so, I, I, I'm I, actually, we need to really understand what is the scale of risk that each of the systems carry, that, and so, what is it that we need to do. So, and that's known. Again, these things are known. There are procedures which are already available. We have to really follow them. Instead of that, you know what's happening? People are islanding themselves. Absolutely. And that's not going to help them yeah. either because the uh, Natanz plant was actually islanded. It was yeah. completely islanded. In spite of that, the centrifuges blew up because of a Stuxnet attack. So we have to understand, even islanding is not going to help. So we really need to analyze what is the risks what? each of them carry. Okay, let me get what happens, you, so, someone will connect a phone line to a, 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 to a computer and that's it. You know, that exposes these, these are all risk. very scary things which you keep, which you people keep talking about. Let me get Shalini Singh on you know this. Shalini, today very interestingly, the the minister Kapil Sibyl, while releasing this policy, says that the real challenge is in operationalizing this policy. Right. Why? What did he mean by that? Well, I think before I get to that question, I'd just like to say that uh, there are very few countries in the world to have a cyber security policy. And by releasing this policy document, uh, India has made a very progressive step forward. We are now aligned with countries like Korea, US, Japan, and several U EU countries. So uh, very progressive, good move. Uh, secondly, uh, a policy is just a statement of intent. Right. It is uh, a directional statement. It lays down what we must do and uh, where we should be headed. So it is just laying out, it is not law. Right. Uh, it will become law. I mean, the processes, the mechanisms, all this will come later. Right. And the importance of this cannot be understated because uh, the internet, uh, I mean, it's cyber security is not just important uh, in terms of the nation's strategic safety, but also in securing the country's GDP growth. The that internet, is, that is, for that, instance. Yes, that's what that's what the minister has been uh, very uh, underlining today, saying that economic st stability depends on cyber security. Yes, for instance, the internet uh, contributes 1.6 percent to GDP, which is something like 30 billion or 1.5 lakh crore rupees, and this is said to more than treble to 5.5 lakh crore rupees by 2015. Right. So, you know, we are not looking at a very small number here and uh, no, economic not, but, security but what, is integral. Uh, right, but, you know, like what kind of challenges do, do you think the, uh, the, the ministry and this whole, this whole effort will face in putting into operation this kind of a policy? Well, I think the largest challenge is in terms of uh, resources. The policy doesn't lay down any commitment about budgets, about you know financial numbers, what is the outlay? Uh, you, we all know that the defense budget was increased this year by what some 13 percent or yeah. uh, some such number. It's a huge 38 billion, uh, 37 billion dollar figure. Right. But uh, for cyber security, which they say uh, is even more critical, we don't see these kind of large numbers. Okay. Uh, secondly, we yes. don't have the resources in terms of the manpower. Uh, physical manpower. Right. And the third component that we need to secure is international collaboration. Absolutely. Where we are at odds, the different ministries are really at odds in terms of their alliances okay. with different countries. Okay. Uh, Ajay Lele, the, uh, you know, this, these challenges which the ministry is talking about, do you think uh, what Shalini is saying and uh, the, the resources, is it the b biggest problem? I think what happens is that to start with, uh, I totally agree with what she is saying. Uh, these are not going to remain only treating troubles. These are going to be huge challenges to my mind. Because what happens is that for all these years, the budget for the cyber was not an exclusive budget. It's not a defense budget it or a railway budget or something. Uh, exactly. It was part of an individual ministry. Now what happens is that you got to grow beyond that. Right. You just can't cut a budget that we got a cyber agency, so we will cut 5% of a budget of a XYZ ministry. That can't be done. So you need to develop a mechanism where you will have a budget which will be an exclusive budget to undertake the cyber efforts. 
But here I think that the silver lining could be if the private industry also comes in, if there is a public-private partnership model which has been brought into it, I really don't know how it will take a shape of it, but at least there is certain amount of a guarantee that you could have certain resources which could be generated. Even government is uh, of the opinion from the, that... From the private sector. Yes, even government is of the opinion that since you are talking of a cyber security, there could be almost uh, business could be coming to the tune of $1 billion within right. the next three years. So from that perspective, I think... Once you start putting things onto the ground, the money may start flowing. I'll, I think we'll need to go into a very short break now. These are, you have raised some important issues and there are some more important issues which needs to be discussed. But we'll come back very soon. Please keep watching. Welcome back. We are discussing the new cyber security policy which has been announced today by the Minister Kapil Sibyl and, uh, and asking several questions regarding that. Uh, Prabir, coming to you, you know, this, this uh, aspect of economic security and how economic security is related to economic growth is related to cyber security and all these things, uh, uh, you know, th that seems to be the focus today of at least the minister was talking very uh, eloquently about it. But I have another question. I have, uh, uh, you know, when we are talking of global, uh, what Shalini was talking about, how we, we will connect globally and things like that, do you think that the present global internet uh, policies or you know, the, the, the way it's connected, is that the way we, we have to go ahead? See, there's two sets of issues, really. One is, what is it that we are trying to protect? And I'm with Ravi that our basic focus at the moment is our vital infrastructure. Right. We are not talking about everyday commerce on the internet. Yes. That has to look after itself for the time being. We can protect the telephone exchanges. We can protect the... Uh, SCADA systems on the dams, the, uh, the nuclear plants, the power plants, and the power grid. Yeah. These are the critical infrastructure of the country we have to protect. We have not built a defense fiber optic network as yet. We need to build that. So these are the things... How long, how long would something like that take? It should have taken uh, six months to 12 months, according to me. We spent 42 months doing nothing about it except flow tender. So we'll come to that as a separate issue. But this is what we need to start with. We must prioritize. Let's not talk about the banking infrastructure at the same time as the SCADA of the dams and of the power plants and the grid. These are completely different class of problems. A bank may go down, the country will survive. If Bhakra opens the way he suggested, yes. then we have a much bigger problem. Absolutely. At hand. So we have to really understand where our priorities are. The second part of it, what you ask, we must understand that the, there are two parts to this. One is a telecom network, other is the internet. And it's very Absolutely. clear, yes. the threat is to the telecom network as well. And if you see the PRISM uh, PowerPoints, you will see there, there it is international submarine cables have been tapped at three right. points. In international waters, the fiber optic cables, 200 of them coming out from the US to Europe, has surfaced in England and they've been tapped there. Right. And I'm sure Australia also it has been tapped. So you have a global tap of the telecommunication system and the internet really doesn't take the shortest part. It takes the largest bandwidth that is available. Therefore, 50% of the global internet traffic flows to the United States, which is again tapped out. So we have a completely one set of issues which is connected to the telecom network, where globally countries have to say no tapping, that you cannot tap this in this way. So you have to set what would be called really global protocols in place as a new thing. The third thing that you said is internet governance. Let's put it, internet governance is the United States runs the internet. India had made proposals, it has backed off. I think it's time to take them up again and have a real multilateral internet governance and not US set the rules for the internet, which is what it is today. Ajay? Uh, I think uh, the moot point is that can internet be governed? The way systems are there today, uh, I entirely agree that uh, just because you know that technologically it's uh, impossible to 100% keep a control on internet, but at the same time you just can't give up. But you, so you, you agree? To, no, yes. you, you agree? I with, totally agree. You agree so, with Prabir that yes. you know it's a completely we, US controlled internet today definitely. and so that we needs need to, to be broad based? No, what, what is important is that we need to raise a stake into the system. Right. Because today we are talking of a say internet 1.0. Uh, after five years, 10 years, you're going to see a mammoth change into the technology. And at that point in time, the internet is going to be entirely a different ball game than what we are seeing today. So until and unless you don't have an effective international structure, because you can have a cyber security policy for India, but it has got no sense if you don't have a 
a multilateral organization which is taking care of it. Recently, we had a group of governmental experts meeting on cyber security which has been going on, where people are understanding what are the, uh, I can say, intentions of so-called big nations and how they really want to take the control of all these things. Right. So, India being a IT superpower in that sense, need to stand up over here and say that, look, we are not going to accept anything which is second hand or a third hand. We would like to be there on the same table when these discussions are going to take place because India's interests are also very, uh, very many interests are crucial. involved into it. We got very crucial interests and now you must have just now heard uh, the way Hindu reporters said that there are only few countries who have got these sorts of policies. So, okay. we are in the best in the world. So, if we did not take a lead over here, then I think we will miss the bus. Ravi, yeah. we, I mean, these, these issues, are, are they being discussed at, at the government level? Are these issues, they, are they aware of this? Are they clear about how they will they move ahead on this? No, I think certainly the Indian government has been discussing this at a very deep level from the late 1990s. And in fact, for this critical infrastructure, uh, information infrastructure protection, they've certainly been looking at it and they're looking at the US model which uh, was uh, formulated by President Clinton. And to go back to summarize some of the previous discussions, it's excellent that they're having the public-private partnership. Of course, I have reservations about some of the multinationals coming in. Well, probably raise yeah, those issues. Absolutely. But as long as uh, there are a lot of good Indian companies which are doing excellent work and which are part of this initiative, and especially the, the universities. Uh, for instance, uh, in U.S., it is a uh, company, it is uh, universities like my alma mater, Carnegie, Carnegie Mellon, Mellon, which was actually the forerunner of this whole plan. Right. There was George uh, Mason University, which was leading in stechnography. And really, it was these were all came, uh, these ideas of a critical information infrastructure protection came out of the universities and were proposed to the U.S. government. And here also, I think, uh, like IIT Kanpur, another alma mater of mine, is also, uh, has done a lot of work in this area of policy for the government. And certainly, it, it requires a partnership between educational institutions, research institutions, government, and the Indian private sector. Certainly, I think the multinational participation should be at a, a separate level where they participate in research programs, but don't have direct access to some of the information. Uh, then. What we really need to protect is, as I said, not so much the e-commerce and the banks, which of course have the money to take care of themselves. It's things like your air traffic control, right? So irrigation systems, your uh, electricity systems, your power systems, water systems, which need to be uh, sewage systems, which need to be uh, really protected, and the railways, the most crucial one. Shalini, coming to you, you know, we have very interesting issues raised here about the private private sector participation. Do you see some kind of a uh, danger or concerns, if you want, uh, about some of these multinationals. Uh, see, uh, Ravi was talking about how the, you know we have to bring in educational institutions, major educational uh, like IITs and things like that to, into into this. Do you see that these private multinationals crowding out these uh, uh, educational institutions? In uh, this, well, in this, this fear that multinational. Uh, uh, companies are a threat to our security, uh, firstly, it doesn't have any place in the real world. All the telecom networks are uh, practically uh, all managed uh, and the components, everything is done by uh, firms, multinational firms from UK, Malaysia, Japan, Singapore, etc. And China. ICT hardware is also all multinational and today the government has increased the FDI limit in telecom to 100%. <laughs> So in the real world, uh, you know, we cannot shut out uh, the multinational influence. Right. I I so I think we need to, uh, you know, move away from that sort of suspicion. But there is a suspicion, they have Shalini. viable business interests. I'll come to you. Sorry, go ahead. Okay, okay. There is a suspicion. There is a fact which is that AT&T as well as Google, Facebook, Microsoft are all partners in this ex exercise. So I do not see why you are calling it a suspicion when it is acknowledged by these companies themselves that they are under US law, they are bound to cooperate with what the US intelligence agencies tell them. No, or so I think the, the real issue is that, that this is very much Chinese, there. Uh, the Chinese right. uh, telecom equipment. I, I think if you have random search parameters, for instance, if you look at the central monitoring system, if you have a C dot uh, intercept box, you know, uh, placed at some juncture at every ISP's sort of uh, network, 
then the ISP is not even aware that the government is snooping on its customers. In fact, the ISPs are so, all aware you know, that they're snooping on so the customers. So, technology is so complex so, so no, that no. we don't know Shal who's snooping and so, how they're entering the network. So, Shalini, mm -hmm. what is the point? The point is that you know this this whole concern about private players, multinationals is something which is which is a redundant uh, concern. See, for instance, ever since I've been covering telecom, Huawei. Uh, all exactly, the, the Chinese snoop agencies have yes. been saying that Huawei is a huge risk. Yes. But Huawei's presence in the country in terms of its business interest, in terms of the fact that it's the most preferred partner in every telecom network, uh, right. has been growing. Okay. So please tell me, how do we reconcile these two issues? Okay. Ajay, how do we reconcile? Uh, I don't think so that we can really reconcile these issues. We need to live with the reality that multinationals will be there. Uh, right now also there is a news and uh, at least in newspapers it's coming up that US and Israeli multinationals have got a great interest into the market which is now Im going to emerge in India. in India. So let's accept the fact that we are staying in the 21st century, multinationals will be there. Only thing is that if you got checks and balances, uh, I know it's a very easy word to pronounce but very difficult to implement, but you need to have certain amount of a positive checks and balances then only you can really Pram control these multinationals. Okay. You can't do away with it. Prabir, them. last words to you. Simple Is issue. Control, control. Simple issue. Checks and balances yes. means in the checking part of it, policy part of it, in multinationals should not be there. If you are going to get equipment from them, by all means, there are ways of checking whether that's right or not. But if you ask them to supply equipment and check and also determine the policy, then I think it's a very okay. dangerous I, I think I, I think Prabir has put it very simply what how we can bring out these checks and balances. Anyway, the, the policy is not even a couple of a few hours old. There will be a much more discussion about this policy and how it, it can be implemented, how it can be operationalized, the enormous problems facing operationalization of this. We'll keep a close watch on it. Thanks to all my guests, Ajay Lele, Prabir Prakayasta, Ravi Vishweshwarya, Sharda Prasad and Shalini Singh. Please keep watching. We'll come back with another issue on the big picture same time tomorrow.